Hi, good morning. So, uh, eu, eu vou começar falando um pouco em português aqui para dar as boas-vindas a todo mundo. Então, primeiro, é, eu vou começar aqui o, o seminário da professora Jenny Hernandes, da Universidade de Los, And Los Andes. Uh, so, thank you very much, Jenny, Jenny, for accepting the invitation and for presenting this work for us. So, let me just tell them a little bit about your, your career. Uh, I found some stuff online here. So, <laughs> uh, let me see if I find it. Where did I make the annotation? You, uh, so, Jenny did a PhD in Trinity College, Dublin. And she was Humboldt Fellow at Max Planck Institute. And now she's professor at Universidade de, uh, Universidade de Los Andes in Colombia, right? And yes. she works on uh, uh, experiment, experimental techniques for uh, characterization and studies on graphene and some other 2D materials. So uh, please, Yen, you can already start your presentation now. Um. Hello, well, good morning, everybody. Bon dia. I am I'm really happy to have the opportunity to tell you a bit about my work. Thank you, Andre, for the invitation. And this is something that we've been working in the last two years, thinking about uh, the the optical properties of graphene and other 2D materials and, and see what, what applications we can we can find. So um So just a reminder about graphene. Graph graphite is a layered material, so it's like a stack of cards, and the cards are, um, are joined by a really weak forces called van der Waal forces. So these layer materials are really easy to exfoliate using something like, like a sticky tape. So you put a, a piece of graphite on a sticky tape and fold it many times on, on, on itself, And then you press it on a substrate, and then and then you get thick layers of graphite that you can you can um, um, get thinner by putting more sticky tape on on, on top, and then exfoliate. So this is uh, a work that started in 2004, maybe uh, before 2004-2003 in Manchester, and the, and the work um, can. Um, led to the discovery of graphene and and you can see these graphene layers with a with an optical microscope just by using interference measurements um, and it's very easy you don't need uh, you don't need um, uh, a scan electron microscope of microscope or AFM to see it you can see it almost with your naked eye and how you can make this graph invisible was I, as I said um, you need to use a substrate where um, the, the graphene uh, produces um, constructive interference um, with, with, the, with the substrate so uh, so so here if you use if you use um, silicon oxide of different thicknesses, If you see the 300 nanometer silicon uh, oxide uh, grown, thermally grown in silicon is the best substrate to 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 work and um, to see graphene. If you use other substrates, you, you, you won't be able to see it. So um, this is this is very important. So it's actually um, it's a, sorry for the slides in Spanish. It's actually if you if you calculate the interference, so it's called the the, the the light that is reflected or um, or transmitted, and then you can calculate it with uh, um, refraction, relative refraction indices, and then you can see uh, the, the changes in the optical path, and then, then you can make graphing visible. And so, for example, here in this graph, you can see that um, for uh, different wavelengths, see here on the, on the x-axis, Um, there are different wavelengths, uh, and, and so mainly in the in the visible range. And so, for example, to see graphene, you, it's better to use uh, uh, light that is between blue and red. So this is blue, uh, 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 red, blue, and green, and then you can see graphene. So the, so these 300 nanometers substrate is the best to 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 see graphene with white light. So if you see with white light, and 200 nanometers, uh, uh, 200 nanometers silicon is not so good. 90 nanometers silicon, not great. So the best um, the best uh, substrate to see, to see 
uh, graphene is um, uh, on silicon with a layer of 300 nanometer of silicon dioxide grown, thermally grown. So it, it, this has been uh, studied for a while. So what, what substrates uh, can I use to see graphene? But how about if, you, if I don't have a substrate? If, so if I don't have a substrate, for example, this is a, 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 a transmission electron microscope image of a graphene layer. This is one. This is one layer here, and this is two layers, three layers. And when you have uh, each of the layers of graphene absorb exactly 2.3% of the incident light. So this is kind of, this is um this is a big number because if you see graphene is 0 0.4 or even uh, less than that um of of uh, thickness or so as as it absorbs quite a, a broad spectrum of light but um so 3% 2 2.3% is is a big number so if you have two two layers so it absorbs um 4.6 so if if you have three layers it absorbs uh, 6.9 and 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 so on. So, and this um, absorption was explained by um, using the uh, the uh, hyper um, the structure uh, constant, the hyperstructure constant. So, um, so it is very interesting. So, graphene has many properties that other materials um, cannot uh, cannot uh, do or do not have. So how do we make graphene? So you can use, you can make it with sticky tape. You can oxidize graphite and produce graphene, gra graphite oxide, and then you can exfoliate and, and produce graphene, um, graphene oxide. The, the, the graphene oxide has many, many functional groups and that you can reduce, but it, it's, it's, it's graphene oxide still. And um, I develop a process called liquid phase exfoliation. And, and in this process is very easy. You can just, Put a little bit of graphite on um, on an organic solvent and put it in a sonic bath and produce dispersion of graphene. So graphite, as I said, is a layer material. So these are the layers um, and the forces between the, the 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 graphite layers are are very weak and it's very similar to what we had known for carbon nanotubes. So um, we could we were able to extend the knowledge that had had been gained at the at the beginning of the 2000s uh, for for nanotubes um, and and uh, managed to exfoliate graphene in liquid phase and so put graphite and the sonic bath and then centrifugation to remove the 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 larger parts that were not exfoliated and then we could produce graphene graphene in liquid phase and this graphene in liquid phase is actually high quality graphene is is not functionalized graphene and is it's useful for applications, and we physicists like materials that um, do not have as many functional groups as, as graphene oxide. And the and how we explain the exfoliation is that um, if you um, use solvents that have uh, surface energies close to the value for graphene, then uh, you can minimize, if you see the surface energy here, you can minimize um, the, entropy, uh, the entropy of the mix. And if you can minimize the entropy of, of the mix, what happens is that the crystals um, feel that is, and they and they swim around and then exfoliate very easily in the in the solvent. So um, we 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 characterize back then on a, um, uh, back then we characterize a, an optical absorption coefficient for for graphene um, that um, we decided in the last two years to correct because we noticed that people were using the were still using this value even though we had reported that value almost uh, 10 years ago and, and and it was important to to correct the value so uh, this is the value that we, that we reported um more than 10 years ago maybe uh, almost 15 years ago so uh, 14 years ago uh, and the solvents that you can use for the exfoliation are within this range so this is um here we have the dimethyl formamide and methyl pyrrolidone and other solvents with with surface um, uh, tensions around 40. These solvents here have the problem that um, have uh, they have uh, 
high boiling points. We tried other things that I will tell you later. And here we have water. Water doesn't work. This is isopropanol acetone doesn't work. But doesn't. But when I mean they don't work, is they don't work for. Um, for the stability. So, but if you if you really need to produce uh, graphene with isopropanol, you could try it. Maybe it, it won't be as thin, but um, but it's not it's not impossible. It's just you have to uh, to put it in the sonic bath for a, for a long time. And then when you exfoliate it, and then you you can you can produce uh, crystals that are thin like this ones. They're 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 very nice, and then um, we try to to think about the Hansen parameters of the solvent. So, uh, in chemistry, people uh, uh, use the Hansen parameters to characterize solvents. So, there's a polar parameter on um, uh, um, a hydrogen parameter, and then with with all the data that we have, the solvents, we we were trying to 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 see if we could if we could discover better solvents that for 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 graphene and um uh, and i think uh, the data is not very clear and then so I, I i think at the end is uh that we don't have actually a, a solution so we have a dispersion is is um we have the crystals swimming around in in the solvents but the the dispersions are not um, stable forever. They they are stable, but for 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 a year or two. But uh, in 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 a longer time, they will they will decant. Um, so this uh, discovery or this development that we did during my PhD um, allowed uh, many companies to sell graphene. So you can buy now graphene on the on the internet. So you go graphenesupermarket.com and and then you can buy graphene. You can buy graphene off site. And then you can have, buy all sorts of black stuff on the internet, and and the, and the black stuff on the internet um, uh, is currently a, a problem, kind of for commercialization, because you need to have a standardization of what actually you call graphene. So you need to you need to see the, so be very clear of what is graphene and what is not graphene, because you can. But we could, you can disperse, for example, um, amorphous carbon, and you will have a, a, a black solution that you could we could mark as graphene, but it is not actually graphene. So it is it is something that the graphene flagship, which is a problem a project from the European Union, is currently working on on how you standardize standardize the process. So and. As you as as the graph, so as the graphene goes grows big, so it has uh, optical properties um, that are very clear. But if, if the graphene is small, for example, if you have graphene and ribbons, the optical that you can produce by 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 many by many um, um, processes, uh, the optical properties are different. If you see here for different for different um, lengths and um, and with the graphene, the graphene and the ribbons have different colors, and it's, it's very interesting because you can relate that to quantum um, confinement, and the quantum confinement uh, uh, works in the in the in the width, not in the in the. So if it is lo longer than than it is uh, wide, then uh, the quantum confinement or the color of the dispersion depends on the on on the width, not on the length. So and this is this is something that I have also worked on for a uh, for a while and then so for, to produce larger gra na gra uh, nanographenes or as the chemists call it, um, poly uh, large polyaromatic compounds. So this is the the ribbons that we have to, we had worked on. So we'll see, you see why the ribbons. Um, have a, a, a color that tends more to the to the gray. So I say it has different shades of gray. This is the work that we do in our lab. Different shades, fifty shades of gray, and then so you can you can see actually um, uh, band half singularities within the, within the spectrum that that is that, and that is quite interesting. So nowadays at Universidad de los Andes, uh, we use a process that we developed in Germany uh, when I was at the Max Planck Institute it's called electrochemical exfoliation. And the electrochemical exfoliation works um, 
with uh, uh, an acid solution, and then you what you do is you you with with the ions you create spaces with within the layers, and at the end you have kind of expanded graphene and expanded graphene. You can exfoliate um, in liquid phase, and then you have um, uh, dispersions like this one. The graphene that you produce with electrochemical exploration has a quite good quality. So, so, so you see this is, a, this is the carbon paper, the graphite paper, and this is the graphene exfoliated in liquid phase. Um, we have a D, a D peak that arises not by the functionalization, but by wrinkles. And, and, and I'll show you in a minute that our, our graphene is really big. But it has wrinkles, and the wrinkles also activate um, a, a disorder peak. And then, so, so see, we have uh, a small number of CO groups, but um, it's not it's not significant. So this is our, our wrinkles, and those wrinkles. So our graphene is large, and the wrinkles activate the D peak on the Raman spectrum. We can produce also graphene oxide using a similar process. And why do we want to produce graphene oxide? So, for example, if you are working with devices uh, that require um, um, an electron-rich layer or, or a, or a, or a hole-rich layer, in particular hole, holes, and uh, graphene oxide could work very nicely. For example, for, for solar cells, um, graphene oxide could work, so we decided to use our electrochemical process to produce graphene oxide, and the graphene oxide is actually very nice uh, in the sense that the that the Raman spectra from our graphene oxide it's here. Uh, sorry, and um, it's here. Oh, I have a problem here. Well, uh, okay, sorry. Please do, <laughs> disregard this part here. The the, um, the Raman spectra here. Um, uh, is, is very nice because the, the, the peaks are well defined when compared to graphene oxide prepared by the Homer's method or the, or, um, the Homer's method. So um, um, I'm going to skip the slide because it's a mess, but uh, uh, if you see the, the UVB spectra, um, uh, the UVB spectra uh, reflects the color of the dispersion. So the graphene oxide is yellower than the, the non-graphene non oxide, the only electrochemical experience one. So, um, so we wanted to see why is that difference and is uh, and the difference um, and the difference that we can assign is by the number of CO groups. So um, so we did FTIR and with FTIR then we were able to characterize the width of the peaks and then see what what difference um, we could find uh, between the oxidized material compared to the non-oxidized material. So what we found is that for the uh, oxidized material, the C um, the CO groups, so if you see here, the full width they have maximally the FTIR uh, peak is uh, 302 centimeters to minus one compared to the um, uh, Lex oxidized, if you if you if you if you will, material um, which is the this one here with with a width of 105 centimeters to the minus one. So the electrochemical process induces um, a certain number of CO groups, but it's small compared to the um, material produced at higher. Um, Acid concentrations. So, um, and then we can we could compare. So we were studying this for a while because we could we wanted to see we wanted to see uh, what the difference in the extinction coefficient. So, as I, as I said, people were using uh, people using the absorption coefficient that we reported 14 years ago. Uh, still. Independently, if it was graphene oxide or if it was an oxidized graphene or liquid phase exfoliated graphene, and we were like, well, it's actually different. The absorption coefficient for um, uh, the unoxidized um, material is uh, 1,414, and um, 
and uh, for the oxidized material is 648. So it's different. You could, you cannot use the same uh, absorption coefficient for a uh, graphene oxide when compared to um, uh, an oxidized graphene. And this is very important for a standardization. If you're going to sell black dispersions around the world, you should be able to tell your, your, your customer what you're selling them. So um, this is what we 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 worked uh, uh, for a while during, during the pandemic. So maybe we were we were studying this spectrum for a long time with my student. Uh, so we we characterize how how this uh, uh, extinction coefficient changes with wavelength. And so this is this is very interesting because you would think that. Uh, the, the extinction coefficient is um, linear with the, with the wavelength, goes linear with the wavelength, but we, we realize it, it doesn't. So um, this is, uh, we, we created a model, a model for that. And then the model, we said, okay, so we have these exponents here, a, a, this exponent here B and this constant A, and then how we can relate those constants to what we're seeing, so what we, what we did, so we did, Talc plots, um, uh, with talc plots, we were able to um, characterize the optical extinction coefficient of an oxidized graphene when compared to graphene oxide. So, so the difference in the optical uh, extinction coefficient um, is due to a larger band gap for the uh, oxidized material. So this is, this is our, our our theory that we wrote for the uh, CO groups and the, the, the effect of the CO groups in the optical band gap. So this is the, the theory that we worked for um, for a long time. And uh, so this liquid phase exfoliation is very interesting that you can extend for other 2D materials. So um, there are thousands of 2D materials. The most famous ones recently are the transition metal like calcogenides. Um, and as if you put those transition metal like calcogenides in, in solvents, then you can you can exfoliate them as well. So you can get a dispersions of molybdenum disulfide or the tungsten disulfide. Um, well, boron nitride is not a, a TMD, but it's also a layer material. And um, so we 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 wanted to exfoliate the MOS2 and and and, and toxin disulfide to see if we could if we could produce um, piezoelectric materials. And why piezoelectric? Because um, these materials, when you exfoliate them, um, their structure changes. Um, the structure changes and then they become non centrosymmetric normally they are very centrosymmetric and when they are very centrosymmetric you 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 won't see optical um nonlinear optical effects but as you exfoliate them the nonlinear optical effects appear and it's very interesting because they appear for um uh, odd number layers so one layer three layers five layers and the even long number layers Two, four, six. They don't. They don't. Um, they they are centrosymmetric. So we wanted to bring our material to the nearly to the mono layer. So we exfoliate them for a lot, long time. Our dispersions are are very clear, but we have material there. And um, and then we wanted to study the optical properties through two measurements, uh, mainly um, ellipsom ellipse optical ellipsometry and it, and it is, is very interesting because we were able to compare our results here in, in, in red and green with the results measured for a single layer exfoliated with sticky tape. So sticky tape produces materials that are, are very are very clear, are, that are, are very non-functionalized, are, functionalized, are, are, they are very uh, kind of uh, perfect, if you, if, if you will. So we, we, we use uh, MOS2, tungsten and disulfide, and we characterize um, the, the optical, uh, the, the ellipsometry measurements, and the, it, it's very good. But interestingly, we found, so we, we, want, we went to the fluorescence spectrometry. 
And in the fluorescence spectrometer, we found that um, we were seeing a half harmonic peak. So if you if you if you um, shine the light at different wavelengths, and so we, well, that's what we were doing. So um, pumping different wavelengths and me and measuring where the half harmonic peak was. And so this is uh, the the bulk material. This is the exfoliated material, bulk exfoliated material. And so in the in the bulk material, um, even though uh, we wanted to attribute this this um, material this effect uh, purely for the exfoliation. It somehow can be seen in the bulk because the bulk is not a bulk. The bulk is a powder. We start from a powder. So mo most uh, researchers start from a perfect crystal that they exfoliate in with stick tape. We start from the powder, so so there's a small signal there, but. Um, we we um, we demonstrated. So if you see here the red and the uh, the red and the green curve um, uh, show that the that the half harmonic um, signal that we were um, we were um, seeing is stronger than the than the than the powder material. So this is something that we um, uh, we attributed to. To the to the exfoliation, we were able also to see uh, piezoelectric effects, and um, so to corroborate that uh, we were that exfoliation was was uh, successful, and then we, then nonlinear optical effects can be studied from can be studied from this, and and uh, we we were lucky because uh, normally measuring. And nonlinear optical properties is very difficult. Um, there, are, there are several groups in, in, in Brazil that, that do it, and um, they're, they're very good, but it's very difficult. And to do it in, in, in the material that is polydispersed, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's even more so. And then we were lucky that we were able to see the signal in the fluorescent spectrum. So, yes, yeah, so this is the, the, the graph that you cannot see. Um, very clearly, so the graphene oxide looks yellower when compared to the to, to the non exfoliated material. So this is the UV uh, absorbence, and then um, and then then see here there are two peaks, and this peak um, uh, uh, arises through the the, the functionalization is shifted. So um, uh, and we shifted to the blue, uh, so it's blue shifted, and then we characterize um, an absorption coefficient that people can use for their dispersions, and, and it's it's different if you have graphene oxide compared to non-functionalized graphene. But and also um, we studied the the MOS2 and Thompson disulfide crystals so they are in a liquid phase. And we were able to see um, non-centrosymmetric features um, through, due, through, due, due to the exfoliation in liquid phase. So um, this is um, the, 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 the story that I wanted to tell you. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm, I'm here for your questions. OK. So thank you very much for the presentation. It was very clear and uh, very nice. So, uh, now the session is open for questions and comments. Vou abrir agora a sessão, então, para comentários e perguntas. Então, o pessoal aí da, da audiência que quiser fazer perguntas, é só escrever aí no chat, certo? Uh, enquanto isso, eu vou fazer aqui algumas perguntas que eu já tinha anotado aqui antes, certo? Uh, so, uh, let me also make some questions that I, I, I took some notes here while you were making the presentation. So, ah, uh, Regarding the process that you are saying that you use this, um, it's I think in, I think they call it sonication. Is that is that how yeah. they call it? Yeah. So in this process, how can you guarantee that everything that you have there is monolayer graphene? Because it, it, can it be that you have some kind of a dispersion that combines uh, monolayer, bilayer, trilayer? So how do you separate these things, and is it possible to to separate these things? Uh, yes, so um, uh, what we're doing at the moment, so in the, in the results that I'm showing here, we we, we, we didn't try um, 
so we, we do, use centrifugation to remove the, the thicker parts to assure that we have that we have um, and more more layers than the others. Um, however, recently we're using um, lithium intercalation for the exfoliation, and with the lithium intercalation, we have thinner crystals, but they're larger. And and the good thing with this is that we are um, separate them in through centrifugation, as they, and it's called um, uh, gravity. Uh, for ultra centrifugation. So if you if you if you use uh, 2,000 RPMs, uh, you have thicker crystals than if you use 3,000 RPMs. So we can separate the 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 thicknesses through centrifugation. So that's what we're doing um, uh, in uh, this year. So we have, we have some results with optical properties that are very nice, and um, and then then we can we can uh, uh, see with with the different thicknesses. Yeah. Okay. Because I, uh, regarding the quality of the work, I think it of the the sample. I think it's very nice because it uh, usually exfoliated graphene will not have these problems of uh, that you have when you have when you nucleate carbon layers in different regions and then you have some cracks or or some yeah. uh, grain boundaries and stuff like that. And that that is not an issue in in what you have, right? Yeah. Exactly. But then uh, you, but, you have to start with. Good material, though, because, for yeah. example, uh, if you start from graphite obtained from from Brazil, it's very nice, and there's a company from Brazil that sells graphite for exfoliation, and then you can use um, kind of a kitchen sieve to 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 start with with gra both graphite, and you, and then you can exfoliate it um, in liquid phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, some of our professors here are congratulating your work here. So uh, Professor Paulo Di Tasso is uh, also working on uh, experimental physics here in our department. So okay. he says congr congratulations for the beautiful work. And also Eduardo B. De Barros, nice work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And one more question, like a, a, another, I'm curious about it because I'm a theoretician. So, <laughs> uh, so once you, you obtain the the solution with or dispersion. I don't know if is there a difference. Yeah, yeah dispersion, right? Yeah, Once you obtain the this, don't like the, that yes, say solution. <laughs> we have better say dispersion. Yeah. So then, once you have the dispersion, are you able to separate the layer and put it on some substrate somehow with a, with a kind of a teaser tweezer or something, or you always have to investigate it in, in form in the form of a dispersion? Well. The good thing with that when you when you actually in, in, in dispersion that, that you characterize in dispersion form is that you don't have to touch it. That's why I like this yeah. be so much. But um, what what we do is that we put drops of the dispersion on silicon, for example, and then okay. we we carefully um, uh, dry the drop, and then the crystals remain there. So um, uh, so we can do it, or or, or we can. Recently, work, work, what we're doing is that we are doing deep coating. So we put the substrate down, and then we kind of wet the substrate with the dispersion, and then a layer can be formed. So, or, or we have also, also used um, a spray coating. So with spray coating, you paint on substrates, and then you can produce a thin layer of the material. So um, we, and also what we, we have uh, painted um, or used a screen printing that the artists use a lot to pr to produce to put graphene on, on fabrics and then we, we 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 work on thermoelectrics as well so it, and then we measure the thermoelectric properties of the fabric and so yeah so all, all the forms that we, we can found we can find okay. to, to, to produce it's too easy to transfer somehow right yeah 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 so there are, there are ways to there are, there are ways to do it yeah yeah okay and now more on the theoretical side, there is this uh, slide that you showed with the uh, optical band gaps of the CEO groups. Yeah. And then there, uh, I, I just saw the slide there. Let me see. This one? Yeah, this, uh, the one on top, on top of the one that you just clicked. Okay, this one. Uh, no, a bit earlier. <laughs> earlier. Yeah, this one. No, yeah. So there you find two numbers there, right? 
Yeah. So one is around three, another around four in the EEGO, which is the oxidized one. Yeah. But also in the other one, you also have two, two gaps. So what are these gaps then? Uh, uh, why, why do you have two of them? Yeah, well, what we do here is that um, this is this is a, a, a process that is kind of an approximation where the optical band gap uh, should be. So if you see here in the in the UVB spectra, you see these peaks here, these peaks here, and yes. this, and then um, the met, the tau plot method. What what the tau plot method does is that it converts this the wavelength to energy. And the yeah. here on the and then you extrapolate the, the line, right? Okay, and on the y-axis you have absorption with energy, and yeah. this component uh, depends if you have a direct semiconductor or an indirect semiconductor. And then, um, so what you do is that that you, that you extra, uh, extrapolate where the where the peak should be. And um, so where the and then this uh, gives you an idea of the optical band gap. So here, if you see, is wide. It should be between one point six and two point seven. And this uh, here for ah, okay, okay. So this is two point two point nine to three point three point eight. So it it's natural that the graphene oxide should have a wider band gap. It's 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 an insulator an insulator because it has many functional groups compared to the unoxidized material. So, and, and the wider band gap is what gives you the color. So is uh, for the graphene oxide is yellower compared to, to, to uh, unoxidized graphene. So unoxidized graphene absorbs in, in a wider range of, 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 of wavelengths and, and graphene, oxidized graphene um, Prefers to absorb in this wavelength, so um, so that's what what that's why um, the color is different. Okay. Yeah. So, are there more questions from or comments from the audience? Tem mais alguma pergunta aí do pessoal que está assistindo? Se tiver, eu vou dar aqui uns cinco segundos para vocês escreverem aí ou dez segundos mais ou menos. <laughs> You can write it in Portuguese, maybe I can... I can yeah, try. maybe, yeah. Yeah, exactly, I can try to, to answer. <laughs> Se podem, se quiserem yeah. escrever perguntas em português também, não tem problema. Uh -huh. So, seems we don't have comments now, so let me just thank you again for your presentation and for accepting the invitation. So no, I hope to we, we can collaborate more in the future. <laughs> yeah. Well, there there are ideas. Uh, Universidad del Sandes is is, uh, is is located in Bogota, and uh, um, and uh, so so we we are here open to for your visits for your collaborations. Yep. To, to please visit us in Bogota next yep. time. Yeah. No, we used it to have a direct flight from Fortaleza to Bogota once I took it <laughs> just to, to as a tourist to, to visit yeah. the city. So it was a six hours flight or something from yeah. Avianca. But it's, 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 I think we don't we no longer have it. But it was very convenient at that time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> hopefully, hopefully soon Avianca will, will, will restart the flight and then because uh, yeah. yeah. We are close, but we're not so close because we're yes, indeed. in Colombia and Brazil and <laughs> are yeah. really, really far apart. So yeah. um, thank you very much again for the invitation. And um, so here, um, so if, if you have more questions, do not hesitate to, to send me an email and then, and then I can, I'll be happy to reply. Okay. So thank you very much and see okay. you. Okay. See you. Bye. 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 Good day.